Okay, this is Darren Mason with Rise Education. This is week 13 of Mathematical Theory of Interest. And today we're going to talk about uh, terms, uh, term structure um, a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, what's called duration. We're going to talk about convexity and, and immunization. Um, but first, we're going to wrap up the term structure stuff by talking about interest rate swaps. So you probably heard about these on the news. Um, but a swap that's a form of a financial contract or a derivative that's designed to allow two parties, we're just going to call them A and B, to cooperate so that the party A agrees with party B to assume party B's obligations and party B agrees to assume A's obligations. And often these obligations are in the form of interest rates, uh, payments, or in commodity payments. Um, they do this with oil and they do this with various kinds of grains. Um, now, although there are many types of swaps, we're going to restrict our attention to so-called interest rate swaps. Um, and in this idea, a floating rate interest obligation, where maybe you pay one interest rate in the first month and a different interest rate in the second month, is swapped for a fixed rate interest where you have the same interest rate all the time in the future. Um, there are more advanced topics on swaps um, that are covered in later parts of the actual science curriculum. But for us, the basic setup is as follows. So a customer borrows L and agrees to some term structure of interest. So that, that's our collection of spot rates. And there are N periods. Now, one option under the terms of the loans is that the customer could pay the one-year spot rate at the end of period one. And whatever the second year one-year spot rate is on L at the end of year two. And you'd have to wait until year two to find out what that rate is. And then in the end of year three, you would pay, you would also do the one year spot rate, um, but you don't know what that's going to be. But anyway, you would do this for as long as the term of the loan was for. Now that's a risk if you do that, because um, you have to wait and see what the one year spot rate is going to be at the start of the second year, and that's not known at the start of the first year. Now. And if that rate is less than the implied rate on the term structure that you're handed, that's I'm circling in orange here, that's up here, that's the term structure you know, um, well, then it's good to wait because you'll get a better deal. So uh, if you just wait and then use the, the market spot rate for one year, a year from now, and that happens to be cheaper than the implied rate by the, the yield curve that you currently are dealing with, well, then it's maybe a good idea to wait. Now, on the other hand, if the implied forward rate that's created by the yield, uh, the yield structure that you have, which is circled in orange, um, is less than the one-year spot rate, well, then you probably should have locked in that rate right away at time zero. So it depends on whether this is a good idea or not, you know, and you can't read the future. So um, interest rate swaps are a way of kind of removing uncertainty that you might have. So you want to avoid uncertainty. And the borrower decides to make interest payments by, that are implied by the current yield curve. Now, as the lender, the person who loaned, say, a person money for a house, at the time of the loan, when the yield curve is in force, you'd expect to be paid variable interest rates of the spot rates at year one and then the forward rates implied by the yield curve for the following years. Um, however, just for planning purposes and making the math easier, it would be nice to find... Um, a constant annual rate that has the same value. So mathematically, this means that the present value of interest rate payments dictated by the yield curve must be related to the desired fixed rate. So we're going to swap the implied variable interest rates in the future each year with a single interest rate that's valid for the entire term of the loan. So to do that, we have this equation that's on the lower left here. This, these are the implied forward rates from the yield curve. This is the discounting that has to be done using the yield curve. This is our loan amount. So this sum is the present value of variable loan payments where the varying is, is um, dictated by the implied forward rates. And the goal then is to say, well, I'd like to have just one single rate and just pay that rate every period. And the present value would be exactly the same. So that way the, the lender would be indifferent to which method you chose. Well, this equation right here is a simple linear equation 
And the only unknown here is is uh, r right there. So you can solve for r just through division, and you get this equation on the right. And that's exactly the same formula we got for the implied swap rate. Oh, I'm sorry, that is the, the implied swap rate uh, for, for the interest rate swap. So all these variable rates that are fixed by the yield curve, we swap them for constant rates. So here's an example. So you have a loan of $3,500,000, and the yield curve happens to be implied by this yield curve. So again, this is RS1, this is RS2, this is RS3, RS4, RS5. Um, but these are all spot rates. And I want to find the swap rate, which would be a level constant interest rate that would yield the same present value as the yield curve itself. So, well, the forward rates, we know from earlier that the forward rates are given by this formula here. We did that in our last lecture to get implied forward rates from a, from a yield curve. And if you do that for this particular problem, you get that the first year forward rate is 2.3%. The second year forward rate implied by the yield curve is 3.91%, and so on, all the way down until you go to the end of year five, and that would be 11.2 interest rate. So you can notice here, for example, that this yield curve is giving larger and larger forward rates in the future, and that's consistent with up here, where you see that the yield curve is normal. It's increasing with time. So if you put that all into the formula uh, to calculate the swap rate, um, you get this expression right here, and you get that the swap rate is 6.40783.782%. So this is the actual swap rate. And it's interesting then to compute what would be your interest payments then. Because if I want to figure out what my interest payments would be on my loan, if I'm going to allow variable rates, I would have to use all these forward rates right here. On the other hand, if I use the implied swap rate, I have the same interest payment every year, so it's reliable. So in, in the... Um, uh, in the $3,500,000 loan, the year one interest payment would be $80,500, uh, but it would be $224,273.84, and you'll notice these are all the same because the swap payments are now fixed interest. But if I had variable interest payments from the implied forward curve, then you would see that they would vary quite a bit. 392-552-41-313-948-69 for year four. So the interest rates vary quite a bit. So this is an example of an interest rate swap structure where I'm swapping variable interest. And again, these are only interest payments. There's nothing in here that says that the principal is being paid down. So these interest rates are computed on the same principle of $3,500,000. So if we substitute R J minus one sub, um, sub J, the implied forward rate um, in year J minus one, then, uh, or sorry, your J, then you have the standard formula that you we've talked about back in chapter six. And if you plug that in and you massage this sort of this formula up here, this one right here, what you find yourself getting is a cleaner and nicer formula to compute the swap rate where there's a little typo here. This should be minus N and this should be minus J there. So I'll fix these uh, in the final copy right there. But um, you get this nice clean formula where all you have to do is uh, subtract off one plus the final spot rate the long, at year, for year n uh, to the minus n over the sum of the spot rates to the minus one plus the spot rate to the minus j over all periods. And I find this to be sort of a cleaner and sort of easier formula to deal with. But they both mean the same thing. So, and again, uh, the above work assumes that the loan amount or that what's called the notional value is constant. Often this is not true and L cannot be canceled leading to more complicated, but you can still create formulas that are relevant. 
Um, swaps are also used, just as a remark here, as cooperative agreements where one party has better access to variable rate credit, like LIBOR, which stands for London Interbank Offered Rate, um, which is a daily average of major global banks with a presence in London, and what they charge other banks for loans. Um, while the other party has may have be better access to fixed rate credit. So you can actually make a deal where somebody has access to variable rate credit and somebody has access to fixed rate credit and both party wants the thing they don't have. The person with fixed rate credit wants variable rate and the person with variable rate interest, they want a fixed rate and they can come up with an arrangement where they both are better off as long as there's a gap between those two interest rates. So it is possible for rates to be swapped by both parties to improve their respective available interest rates. So occasionally I'll be taking a coffee sip, which is what I just did. All right, so now we're gonna focus on evaluating the average repayment time for investments and the related notion of what's called interest rate risk that can exist for future cash payments, such as loans, bonds, et cetera. So, there's this notion called duration, and really what it is, is it's the average time to repay for a bunch of cash over time that you're supposed to get. Um, and how does the value of cash flow change as the yield rate changes? So if you, you have a present value of some cash flow, it'd be nice to know how that, if I change the, the yield rate a little bit, how does that change the present value of my cash flow? And that's related to the derivative of the present value as a function of the yield rate. And this is related to an idea called modified duration, which is, which is related to the above duration. So there's going to be duration, which is uh, often called Macaulay uh, duration. And then there's going to be what's called modified duration. And they're very closely related, which is this um, depends on the yield rate. And then lastly, we'll talk about how do we best allocate a portfolio investment to protect it from decreasing in the event of some interest rate shift. We don't want the, the portfolio to go up um, drastically if the interest rate goes uh, moves around, and we also don't want it to go down. So we'd, we'd like to keep it you know, in the positive realm of value. We don't want it to go down whether the interest rate decreases or increases. So this is related to notions of what's called convexity and immunization. So we'll talk about that as well. So first we'll talk about Macaulay duration which is really just duration. And it's a very simple idea. So suppose you have a cash flow vector K here with P payments. And there's a periodic yield rate J every period. So we know from all the work we've been doing in this class that the present value of that cash flow is simply the discounted sum of K sub P divided by one plus J to the P where P goes from one to N. So technically this should actually be N right there. So the Macaulay duration, which I'm going to write as capital D sub Mac, um, is defined to be the average time it takes to be repaid by the cash flow. So this is a weighted average, kind of like the way you do expected values in probability, um, is the, the longer I have to wait, the more I wait it. So uh, I'm summing here 1 plus, uh, 1 plus J to the pth power. Uh, divided into k sub p in the denominator. So the bottom here is just the value of the cash flow. So notice how this is the present value of the cash flow. But the top is this weighted sum, weighted present value, because I'm multiplying each term by p, and p is running from 1 to n. So if you divide those two, you get what's called the Macaulay duration. So to sort of convince yourself that this is not a crazy idea, um, imagine you had an N year zero coupon bond with a redemption amount R and a yield J. So what is that? That is a um, cash flow where I get nothing until I get my final payment, the face value of the bond. So the cash flow vector for a zero coupon bond is zero, 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 all the way until you get to the final payment, which is the redemption amount of your bond. But because there are no coupons, you don't get cash any other way. So we know that the price value of that kind of a bond is the redemption amount divided by one plus J to the N, we've done that. And if you plug that into the formula for Macaulay duration, um, 
you get in the denominator r times 1 plus j to the minus n. And this sum, well, the only term in this sum that survives is the last term, which is n times the redemption amount times 1 plus j to the minus n power. And these cancel, that cancels, and I'm left with just n. And that makes total sense. I paid some money, I bought a zero coupon bond, and I don't get my, any of my money back until the very end. So it makes sense the duration is when I get paid that redemption amount. You know, that's not true. It's not true if you're doing things um, like with a coupon bond where you're getting money constantly throughout the period. So the Macaulay duration then for a zero coupon bond is just the term of the bond. So that kind of makes sense that, yeah, this is measuring time to payment. So here's an example where that's not, uh, it's not just a zero coupon bond. We have a five-year, $10,000 par bond, semi-annual 6% coupons. It's priced to yield at I2 equals 7%, so nominal annual interest rate compounded semi-annually. And you're asked to find the Macaulay duration of the bond. So our, what's our cash flow vector look like? Well, there are semi-annual coupons. The nominal annual coupon rate is 6%. So the six-month coupon rate is 3%. Times 10,000 is 300 bucks. So every six months, I get a check for $300. Here, here, here. And then in the last period, I get another coupon, 300, plus I get that whole $10,000. So if you're gonna write the formula for the duration of that, uh, the Macaulay duration of that bond, well, your coupons, your case of P's, right? case of P is 300, one less than or equal to P, less than or equal to N minus one, and then case of P is equal to 10,300, P equals N. So that's why I have a sum here from one to 10 of just the coupons, 300, and then a final amount that is the redemption amount. And again, notice is multiplied by P, and then downstairs, I have the value of the bond, which is here. That's the pricing, the price of the bond, which we did um, a couple chapters ago. And you can write this term right here as an increase in annuity. Um, so it's actually 300 times an increase in annuity, 10 payments, 0 0.035 is the yield, plus my redemption payment, its present value discount, and this is just the bond price, and you get 2.0977. So notice that I don't have to wait 10 years or five years to get all my money back. This is a five-year bond that about 2.1 years into the bond, I've gotten paid all my money back. So that, that means that this bond has a short duration, just two years, even though it's a five-year bond. So that's one example. Um, in the general case, if you just think about a general bond with level coupon payments, so here are the first n minus one coupon payments. Remember, they're all face times coupon rate. And the last payment is face plus the last coupon payment. So last coupon plus redemption. And you plug that into the formula, you'll notice that all the Fs cancel here, here, and here. And you're left with, um, this nice formula like this right here, which gets even simpler if you use the increasing annuity idea that we saw in the last example, and you get this final simple formula right here, which simply says that you take the coupon rate times an increase in annuity um, with term n and yield j, plus n times one plus j to the minus one, and then downstairs is the value of the bond except the face value is missing because we canceled out the face value. So this can be probably your easiest formula for finding the Macaulay duration. Now, there's another kind of duration called modified duration. And just so we don't get confused, modified duration, I'm gonna write D sub mod. Uh, in some books, you might see just the letter D for Macaulay and modified duration, they might write MD or DM, just as paired capital letters. I find the subscripts to be more useful when you're first learning this, because it really helps you understand which one you're talking about. So 
What is this for, the modified duration? It's used to measure the percentage change of the present value of a cash flow with respect to the underlying yield rate, J. So if you, uh, if you, uh, uh, so the, the percentage change, this is kind of like, uh, you see this in mathematical modeling where they'll do uh, sensitivity analysis. But basically what this says is it's the rate of change of the present value in terms of the yield rate divided by the value itself. And then there's a minus sign here, so we get a positive number. Um, because generally, the derivative of the numerator is going to be negative. That is, the higher I make my yield, the lower the value of my um, value, uh, uh, the lower the value of my um, investment is going to be, the net present value. And so you expect this derivative in the numerator right here, you expect that to be negative. So I have that written in this little comment. So if I use the chain rule, um, so here, modified duration, negative P naught primed over P naught. I actually take the derivative of P naught. So remember, P naught of J is the sum, P equals one to N of KP over one plus J to the P. That's that. So when I differentiate that using the chain rule, I get this quantity right here. That's the result of differentiating that. This is P naught prime of J. So I, notice I have a P plus one down here. So I take one of those, one plus J, and I factor it out. That's where this comes from. And then what I'm left with is, gosh darn it, it looks just like the Macaulay duration. In fact, that's exactly the formula for the Macaulay duration. So you get this nice relationship that the Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus j is the modified duration. So the time-weighted average Macaulay duration and the measurement of interest rate risk, d mod, are very closely related. So, and uh, that, that's sort of, I think, very helpful. So here's an example, modified duration. So an eight-year bond has a modified duration of six and a half years and an annual effective yield of 5%. If its current price is 48,000 euro and the yield rate increases to 5.5% from 5%, so it goes up a half a percentage point, find the approximate new value of the bond. So this is where we sort of pull out our calculus. So notice here that P naught of J plus H is approximately equal to P naught of J plus P naught primed of J times H plus dot, dot, dot. So this is the linear approximation of what we have here. So if I look at the modified duration and you actually uh, construct this arrangement using this information, well, the P naught prime, notice that P naught prime of J is equal to P naught J plus H minus P naught of J divided by H. So you'll see that right here. So I'm getting that term from right here. So P naught prime the numerator is being estimated by this expression. Um, and then the P naught J, that just comes along for the ride here. And the minus sign is still there, right there. And in this case, J, my base interest rate was 5%, but the change in interest rate was a half a percent. So 0 0.005, that's my H. So if I want to compute um, the new value of the bond at 0.055%, this is P naught of J plus H. That's going to be a, approximately minus the modified duration times the value of the bond at 5% times H, which is the actual, um, uh, the actual jump in the interest rate, 
plus the old value. So I'm going to highlight these in orange, yellow so you can see these. This number is the same as this number. And this number is H up here. And this number here, well, what is that? It's related to the modified duration because notice that, uh, if I notice that P not, or I'm sorry, P primed of J is equal to minus D modified times P not of J. That relationship comes strictly from what's written right here. And so I'm replacing P naught primed here with this entire expression. In fact, they all actually go together. So notice the parallel between this and that. And that's coming from that. So we're really, really just doing a tangent line, linear approximation from Calc 1. There's just a lot of new terms involved here, but you're doing nothing more than a linear approximation you do in Calculus 1. So then you plug in all the numbers, minus 6.5 years, 48,000 euro, one half a percent, 48,000 euro. And you get that the new bond price is actually 46,440 euro instead of 48,000 euro. So it goes down, which makes sense because the yield rate went up. So we're really just using tangent line constructions from Calc 3, or I'm sorry, Calc 1. Now, just a comparison here because there is this close relationship between the modified duration and the Macaulay duration. Um, for the modified duration, um, instead of using the periodic yield, I could assume that I have the equivalent constant continuous force of interest delta with also period P. That is, rather than one plus J to the P power in the denominator, that's the same as E to the minus delta P. So I'm replacing this with that. And if I take the derivative of that expression with respect to delta, I get this expression that comes out, just differentiating term by time term by term. And then if you remember that e to the minus delta p is really 1 plus j to the minus p, and you plug that back in, you get that 1 over p naught times this sum is really 1 over p naught times the sum here. And this expression, though, Oh, I'm sorry, I dropped a P here. There should be a P right there. There should be a P. Because I'm just recopying and changing the interest rate. Uh, but this is the same as this. With a minus sign. So I really have the derivative of the value of my cash flow where the derivative was taken with respect to the continuous annual rate divided by the value of the cash flow, again with this minus sign here. So that you can think of the Macaulay duration as used as a percentage change of the present value of a cash flow um, with respect to the continuous rate. So Macaulay duration is actually, has the same interpretation as modified duration, it's just that one is the effective annual rate and the other one is the continuous rate. So. Um, you can think of them really as variations on the exact same idea. Now, because of this approximation business that we did up here in this example, I'm going to generalize that in a slide here, that, for example, 1.3, which is the one we just did, we really had that the new value of the bond was the old value of the bond minus the modified duration times the old value of the bond times H. Well... Because I have this connection for Macaulay, that this is equal to this, I can do the exact same thing. So for Macaulay duration, you can also say that the new value of my bond, if I change the continuous rate by an amount h, is the old value of the bond minus the Macaulay duration times the value of the bond um, times the little change h. 
So this is a linear approximation where you're differentiating with respect to the annual continuous interest rate. And the top here is a linear approximation where you're differentiating with respect to the annual effective yield. So here's an example. Um, a 10-year bond has a modified duration of 6.5 years and is valued with a continuous annual yield of 7.4%. If its current price is $9,755 and the continuous yield rate decreases to 0.75%, what's the approximate new bond value? So notice how we have this word continuous in this problem. And because of that, that screens Macaulay duration. So now, but I'm not given the Macaulay duration. I'm given the modified duration. So I have to translate between the two. So the first thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to find out what the effective annual yield was, which is e to the 0 0.074 minus 1, about 7.68%. And then remember this relationship we had that the Macaulay duration is 1 plus j times the modified duration. So the Macaulay duration is about 6.99924 if the modified duration is 6.5 years. Therefore, the new value of my bond at the lower yield rate is the old value of the bond minus the Macaulay duration the change in the interest rates, this is going to be minus 0 0.0025. And then this is the old bond value. And if you plug all those numbers in, you'll get that the value of the bond goes up to $9,925.70, which also makes sense because remember, yield rates and bond values, they're, 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 they behave inversely. So here the yield went down, so the bond value went up. If the yield went up, like in the last example, the bond value goes down. Um, you can also play the duration game with perpetuities. So remember from our way back when we were doing annuities, the value of a perpetuity with a face value F, where you're getting paid some amount F, is just F divided by J. So even though this has no finite term, we can still find the Macaulay duration of this by using infinite series. So first recall again that Macaulay duration is one plus J times modified. We just used that in the last example, which is gonna be minus one plus J, and I'm using the modified definition, dp naught dj over p naught of J, and that's right there. And then I plug in the formula for that using this expression for p naught of J, the annuity formula. And if you plug everything in and you cancel, you get that the Macaulay duration on an infinite perpetuity is 1 plus 1 over J. And that's what that is. In terms of the effective annual rate. Now, another way to think about this, if you wanted to calculate this, is you could say, well, I could just find the value of being paid F times P, 1 plus J to the minus P, and take this as an infinite series. I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity here and here. And if you do that, you get an increasing perpetuity divided by a perpetuity, which is 1 plus i over i squared, divided by 1 over i, which gives you 1 plus 1 over i, which is exactly the same thing that we got that way. So two different ways of computing the exact same idea, namely, what's the Macaulay duration on a perpetuity? So it's just 1 plus 1 over i or 1 plus 1 over j, whatever interest rate you're using. So to be consistent, I should probably make these j's. So and this would be a j, just to be consistent with what I have over here. OK. So um, if we do a little bit more calculus, if I want to find the rate of change of the duration, um, you could do that. So I could take the derivative of the Macaulay duration with respect to j. And that is this expression here. Now that's a quotient rule. So you've got a bottom times derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which I have right here, divided by the denominator squared, which is here. And if you simplify, you can rewrite that. So it's 
minus 1 over 1 plus j times the sum of p squared times kp over 1 plus j to the p in the numerator, and then this entire sum of the denominator, minus um, a weighted sum divided by a weighted sum as squared. So that looks kind of messy. So what you do is you define omega sub p to be this term divided by this term. And this creates um, a family. I'm sorry, not the, I take that back. Let me write it off to the side. So really, I mean this term divided by um, this sum right here. And this forms a weighted sum. These look like probabilities. The omega sub p is between 0 and 1. And if you add them all up, you get 1. So they look like a family of discrete probabilities that are useful in interpreting the Macaulay duration. Well, how is that? Well, again, if you go back and you look at um, these expressions, but you take this omega p idea into it, you can simplify that down to this nice formula right here which says that the derivative of the Macaulay duration with respect to the annual yield is minus 1 over 1 plus j times the sum of p squared times omega p minus the sum of omega p times p quantity squared. So if you think about this from a probability lens and you think about having a random discrete variable x where x can be equal p for p ranging from 1 to n, and the probability that x is equal to p is given by one of these sort of artificial probabilities, omega sub p. And if you do that, then this expression right here really becomes the expected value of the square of the random variable minus the square of the expected value of the variable. And you've probably seen that in probability class where variance... Oops, Variance is equal to the expected value of the square of a random variable minus, oftentimes they'll write it this way, the square of the mean of the random variable. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking this. I'm using it right there. So what you end up with is that the rate of change of the Macaulay duration with respect to the yield is really the variance of a random variable, x, where the probability that it's equal, uh, p is the value of x is omega sub p. And that's clearly negative because we know the variance is positive, so that's clearly a negative quantity. So here I'm mentioning we've used this probability theorem here. So the upshot is, conclusion, so as the effective yield increases, you first should find that your Macaulay duration decreases, leading to an interpretation that investors are paid back sooner if the yield on their investments increases. So yield goes up, you get your money back faster. So that's one way to interpret this particular outcome. So we've talked about uh, investments, we've talked about perpetuities, we've talked about bonds, we've talked about modified duration, Macaulay duration, various ways to compute things, some numerical examples a little theory like we have right here. Um, the next thing is we can amp this up and talk about portfolios now and durations of portfolios. So what's a portfolio first? Well, it's simply a collection of a different bunch of assets of different types. So you got a bunch of assets and you have a certain amount of each one, you put them in a book and you call that a portfolio. So it's an ensemble. And so if I think about a portfolio, capital pi, which is the letter I'll use, that it's really investment one, it's value P, sub one of I, investment two, all the way up to investment N. And PK is then is the present value of the kth investment in the portfolio with yield J. And then if you want the total value of the portfolio, you just add those up. So as with the case with single assets, we can ask, well, what's the Macaulay duration of my portfolio? How long do I have to wait to get my money back in this portfolio where I have a blend of assets? So to do that, the definition is the same. So um, minus 1 plus j 
over the derivative of the value of the portfolio with respect to J divided by the value of the portfolio in terms of J. And then you get then, uh, because my portfolio is a sum, when I differentiate it, I just get a sum of derivatives, which is what I have here. And then you do a little trick, um, is you do sort of what a lot of people's favorite tricks are, is you multiply and divide by the same thing. So what I'm going to do is that in every term of this sum right here, I'm going to multiply by PKI, and I'm going to divide by PKI. So the two things I just boxed up, oh, I hit the wrong thing, right? These things are going to cancel. I think I made my eraser too big. So they're going to cancel. They're just equal to one. So I haven't really changed anything, but I'm multiplying and dividing for, for a good reason. This quantity, um, use a different color. This quantity right here, that fraction that the wiggly lines below, is the value of a one piece of the portfolio divided by the value of the whole portfolio. So I'm going to call that W sub K. So it's the ith portfolio's percentage value of the whole portfolio. And then I have, uh, if I do that, then I look at that. Then the other thing that I have here, well, that's the rate of change of the kth portfolio item divided by the value of the kth portfolio item. But when you multiply that by minus 1 plus j, well, that's the Macaulay duration for that piece of my portfolio. So this whole sum turns into something very nice, that the... Duration of a portfolio, the Macaulay duration of a portfolio, is really the sum of the Macaulay durations of each piece of the portfolio times the percentage of the whole portfolio in value that particular piece of the portfolio occupies. So this formula is very nice. This is connecting these two things right here. That's a very nice thing to have to use. So let's do an example of that. So you're building a portfolio and you want to offer up investments to a client. Uh, and the portfolio has three items in it, all with Macaulay durations. So it has two 20-year $5,000 bonds that were bought at par and with a duration of 11.6 each. You've got X 15-year annuities, each purchased for $2,300 with a duration of 8.4. And you have three shares of stock that was purchased at $1,798 and has a duration of 6.5. Now the customer insists that their portfolio have a duration that is no longer than nine. That is, they don't want to wait any longer than nine years to get their investment back. Find the minimum integer number of annuities, 15 year annuities X, so that the portfolio meets the customer's requirements. So I have a portfolio, again, that has three things. It has 20-year $5,000 bonds, has 15-year annuities, although I don't know how many, has three shares of stock, and I want to figure out how many 15-year annuities I need so that the entire portfolio duration is no longer than nine. So that's the question. So a pretty practical question. So let's break this up into pieces. First, the portfolio value. Because what I want to compute is this, right? I want the portfolio of the entire, or I'm sorry, the duration of the entire portfolio. And I have this as my nice expression for that. So first, the value of my portfolio, well, it's two times 5,000 plus X times 2,300. That's the present value of the annuities. And then three times the stock price of 1,795. And if you add all that up, you get $15,394 plus 2,300X. So that's the value of my portfolio at time zero. Now the duration of my portfolio is, well, the percentage value of the bonds, because they were bought at par, I paid 5,000 each for them, the value of the bonds at time zero is 10,000 because I have two of them. So this ratio here is the percentage of the total value of my portfolio that the bonds occupy. And then that's multiplied by the given duration of the bonds, 11.6. 
the value of my annuities is 2300 $2, per annuity times X annuities. And I divide that by the, the value of my portfolio. And I multiply that by the duration of the annuities, 8.4. And then lastly, I take the number of stock shares I have times 1798, which is the price. And I divide that by the value of my um, portfolio. And I multiply that by the duration, 6.5. And if you put that all together and simplify, you get 151,061 plus 2,300 times 8.4 times X over 15,394 plus 2,300 X. And since I don't want to exceed nine, I require that this expression here, well, it's never larger than nine. So I put up an inequality and demand that it doesn't exceed nine. So all I gotta do now is solve for X. And that's a straightforward algebra problem. And you'll find that X has to be at least 9.0, X will be at least, I'm um, sorry, X should be at least 9.06884. So since I want the integer value that's gonna give me the duration I want, I can't um, choose nine annuities. I can't choose 9.06884 annuities. I must choose 10 annuities. So you buy 10 15-year annuities, and then I'm guaranteed that the Macaulay duration will be less than or equal to 9. And in fact, if you compute the Macaulay duration for the portfolio, if you buy 10, so just go back up to this expression here and plug in x equals 10, you'll get that the duration of the portfolio is 8.662, which is certainly less than 9. So that's nice. So now I have... Um, I've achieved the, the wishes of my investor, my client, uh, and figured out how many annuities should be in this portfolio to achieve a certain investment goal. Okay, so we're almost done. One more topic to cover, and that's cash flow immunization and convexity. So this is related to your knowledge of calculus from Calc 1. So an institution such as a bank or an insurance company will have both assets and liabilities, which may come due at different times. And these may be structured so that the net present value of the institution is zero for some interest rate. That is our internal rate of return idea from earlier. So approximately zero for the net present value. Now, if I achieve such a goal, that's often called matching assets to liabilities, that the value of my assets and the value of my liabilities balance each other. Um, now, what if this rate J here changes a little bit? So rate J is perturbed slightly. Well, the institution may find itself with a negative net present value, and that's not desirable, and you want to avoid that. So how can you avoid that? Well, often people, what they'll do is they'll, rather than try to have just the derivative of P naught be zero, you know, because that could be this situation, this situation, or that situation, or that situation. If where I'm putting a dot is the zero value, only one of the four items in this picture here, where the vertical axis is the, is the value of the uh, portfolio, or the value of the investment, um, only one of these is friendly to interest rate changes. And that's this one right here. Because if I move to the left or to the right of the little blue dot, I'm gonna go up. That is the value of my uh, um, investment is gonna go up. So it's in some sense immunized or, or secured from adverse interest rate changes. You know, in this picture here, if I go left or right, the, interest, the value goes down. Here, if, I, if the interest rate goes up, the value of my investment goes up, but if the interest rate goes down, the value of my investment goes down. And this is the reverse. If the interest rate goes down, the value of my investment goes up. And if the interest rate goes up, the value of my investment goes down. So the one that we want is the orange one. So the conditions that make that happen is, well, I want the value to be zero. That's matching assets to liabilities. I want the first derivative to be zero. So that gives me a flat spot on the curve. And I want the second derivative to be positive. That's the second derivative test. And that is what makes this orange one special because that's P 
P double prime to not of J is greater than zero. So that's the local minimum second derivative test from calculus one. So I want these conditions to be satisfied. So this is called Reddington immunization. So suppose P not pi of j is the present value of a portfolio pi. Then pi is said to be Reddington immunized at a rate j star if its value is zero, the first derivative at that same yield rate is zero, and the second derivative at that is positive. So the same conditions I just put for the orange curve on the previous slide. And keep in mind, this is a local condition. So it's just for small deviations in the interest rate. Because then you would have from, from just your Taylor series that the change in value of my portfolio is approximately zero plus a positive quantity because this second derivative is greater than zero. So small moves in the interest rate away from JSTAR do not lower the value of the portfolio. It is protected in this sense. So you could think of that as immunization. So oftentimes, just for convenience, um, the second derivative of the portfolio divided by the value of the portfolio is called the convexity of the portfolio. And if you use that notation, that's called gamma, then you get the relative change in the size of the portfolio. So uh, the change in the portfolio divided by its original value is minus the modified duration times h plus the convexity gamma times h squared over two. Now, um, on the other hand, suppose that you have the value of a portfolio. We say pi is fully immunized if its value is always greater than zero, zero for any interest rate. And what makes this harder is it's a global condition. That is, this says that no matter where the interest rate goes, the value of my portfolio will never become negative. So this is a global condition. And generally, this is difficult to check. There are some special circumstances where it's true, though. So let me just say a, a word about that. So full immunization, which is what we just mentioned. Um, if you have one liability, outgoing cash, and it's sandwiched between two assets or incoming cash, full immunization is guaranteed. So suppose you have a portfolio pi with a cash flow K1, K2, K3, where the only liability is K2 at time T2, and the two assets are K1 and K3 at times T1, T3, and the time is ordered the way you would think. Then, if the net present value P naught of J is zero at J star and its first derivative is zero at J star, then pi is fully immunized. And um, I'm not gonna prove it, the basic idea is to write the value of, uh, of the portfolio is a positive quantity times a function of j, such that the function is decreasing when j is less than or equal to j star, and it's increasing when j is greater than or equal to j star. Um, but it, the proof isn't too hard. You may want, if you want to, you can give, take a crack at it. So that's an example where you do have full immunization and the checking is not very hard to do. But let's do a more practical problem with Reddington immunization. So suppose you manage a pension fund and the employees expect an annual effective rate of return of 15% on current liquid assets of $75 million to be paid at the end of 10 years. That is, in 10 years, the employees expect $75 million that had grown at 15% year over year. Now, this is a big liability for your pension fund. So to manage this liability, the fund manager, you have two different assets that you can use to immunize the portfolio. So... There are 10-year, $1 million PAR bonds that redeem at PAR and pay annual coupons at an effective rate of 8%. Or there are $100,000 increasing perpetuities. So they pay $100,000 the first year, then $200,000 the second year, $300,000 the third year, and so on. And we're going to assume a flat yield curve so that the effective annual interest rate is 7.2%. 
And the question is, how much of each asset should be in the pension fund to make it ready to immunize? So if you think about this, you're going to have an obligation at the end of 10 years for that 75 million at the 15% growth rate. And you're going to have assets that after you figure out how many of the 10 year 1 million par bonds will pay you coupons and redemption amounts at 10 years. And you have uh, increasing perpetuities as well. And you can buy some of those as well. The question is how many of each of these do I buy? So let's let X be the number of $1 million coupon bonds purchased and Y be the number of $100,000 increasing perpetuities. And I'm going to denote J uh, to be the yield for this. So for the bonds, the present value, we know this very well, is, well, they're 8% annual coupons. The face value is a million. So my coupon payments are $80,000 at the end of every year for 10 years. So the present value of those payments is that number times a sub 10 J, and then the redemption amount discounted to time zero, which is $1 million divided by one plus J. So this is the present value of a single bond of that type. And if you want, you could write it this way. Uh, for an increasing perpetuity, this is the present value for an increasing perpetuity times the face value of 100,000. So this expression represents the present value of one $100,000 increasing annuity at rate J. And the liability that I'm going to have to pay, well, it's negative because I got to pay it out. 75 million was the notional amount. It grew by 15% for 10 years. So ultimately that's what I'm going to have to pay. But then you have to discount that back to time zero with the interest rate. So this is kind of like how we compared uh, interest rates to inflation earlier in the class. So this is my big liability, this last one. So the present value of the entire portfolio then is given by this expression. I have 75,000 in the bank or 75 million in the bank right now. X times the number of bonds I buy using the formula above plus Y times the number of increasing annuities that I buy. That's the formula above plus the liability, which is actually has that negative sign in it. So if I plug in the numbers, I get 75 million plus X times the value of the bond. This is the present value of all the coupons. And then X times the present value of all those redemptions. And then Y times my $100,000 increase in annuity minus the 75 million times the 15% growth rate to year upon year for 10 years, divided by the discount rate, the di uh, or multiplied by the discount rate or divided by one plus the yield. So 0 0.072 is the, uh, the flat curve that we've assumed for the yield. And if you plug in 0 0.072 for J everywhere you see it, you will get this equation. And I'm not gonna read it off, but uh, it's, a, it's a single linear equation involving X and Y, which are two unknowns. Then you take this expression right here and you differentiate it in J. So if you differentiate it in J and then evaluate it at 0 0.072, you will get this equation equaling zero. So that's another equation for X and Y. So you put these two together and I have two equations and two unknowns. So that's a linear algebra problem. You know, that's two equations, two unknowns. That's a high school algebra problem. So you solve those two equations for X and Y, and you get investment allocations that are needed that X has to be 30.22266 of the $1 million bonds, and I should buy 2.1511 of the $100,000 increasing perpetuities. And if I do that, then the present value of my investment is zero, and the portfolio derivative at that interest rate is zero. So I'm still, no, still not done yet. I need to verify that these choices of X and Y, that my second derivative is going to be positive because that's the third requirement for writing it. So uh, you can do this uh, by hand. You can get an algebra computer system to do the derivative. I use Mathematica. 
and you do the second derivative of that with respect to j, and you evaluate it when x is 30.22, y is 2.15, and j is 0 0.072, and you get a very large positive number, 3.67 times 10 to the 10th, which is certainly positive. So that guarantees that my pension portfolio is fully Reddington immunized. Oh, I don't, Reddington immunized um, at the yield rate of 7.2%. Now in this example, a couple of things that we haven't accounted for that can show up in real life. Well, fluctuating interest rates are one risk factor. It's called interest rate risk. Um, you know, we did this with a flat yield curve. You could try and do this with a non-flat yield curve. And another important factor is known as longevity risk. Um, this is due to the possibility that a pensioner may live longer than you expect. Um, if you have a pension plan, which is what's called a divine, defined benefit plan, you're supposed to pay somebody in a certain amount of dollars for the rest of their life. And hedging against such a possibility is extremely important. And that's covered in more advanced courses and actuarial models. Um, but dealing with the fact that people might live, they might die sooner, they might die later, um, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And that's where you sort of take this kind of stuff we've done in this class and you connect it with probability. And in the more advanced actuarial exams, that's, that's done. So that's it for today. And that's actually the last lecture for the class. So this one's a bit of a long one. And uh, I will post this. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, this is Darren Mason with Rise Education. This is week 13 of Mathematical Theory of Interest. And today we're going to talk about uh, terms, uh, term structure um, a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, what's called duration. We're going to talk about convexity and, and immunization. Um, but first, we're going to wrap up the term structure stuff by talking about interest rate swaps. So you probably heard about these on the news. Um, but a swap, that's a form of a financial contract or a derivative that's designed to allow two parties. We're just going to call them A and B to cooperate so that the party A agrees with party B to assume party B's obligations and party B agrees to assume A's obligations. And often these obligations are in the form of interest rates, uh, payments or in commodity payments. Um, they do this with oil and they do this with various kinds of grains. Um, now, although there are many types of swaps, we're gonna restrict our attention to so-called interest rate swaps. Um, and in this idea, a floating rate interest obligation where maybe you pay one interest rate in the first month and a different interest rate in the second month is swapped for a fixed rate interest where you have the same interest rate all the time in the future. Um, there are more advanced topics on swaps and they're covered in later parts of the actual science curriculum. But for us, the basic setup is as follows. So a customer borrows L and agrees to some term structure of interest. So that, that's our collection of spot rates. And there are N periods. Now, one option under the terms of the loans is that the customer could pay the one-year spot rate at the end of period one, and whatever the second year one-year spot rate is on L at the end of year two. And you'd have to wait until year two to find out what that rate is. And then in the end of year three, you would, pay, you would also do the one-year spot rate. Um, but you don't know what that's going to be. But anyway, you would do this for as long as the term of the loan was for. Now, that's a risk if you do that. Because um, you have to wait and see what the one-year spot rate is going to be at the start of the second year. And that's not known at the start of the first year. Now, and if that rate is less than the implied rate, on the term structure that you're handed, that's, I'm circling in orange here, that's up here, that's the term structure you know, um, well then it's good to wait because you'll get a better deal. So uh, if you just wait and then use the, the market spot rate for one year, a year from now, and that happens to be cheaper than the implied rate by the, the yield curve that you currently are dealing with, well then it's maybe a good idea to wait. Now on the other hand, if the implied forward rate that's created by the yield, uh, the yield structure that you have, which is circled in orange, um, is less than the one-year spot rate, well, then you probably should have locked in that rate right away at time zero. So it depends on whether this is a good idea or not, you know, and you can't read the future. So um, interest rate swaps are a way of kind of removing uncertainty that you might have. 
So you want to avoid uncertainty. And the borrower decides to make interest payments by, that are implied by the current yield curve. Now, as the lender, the person who loaned, say, a person money for a house, at the time of the loan, when the yield curve is in force, you'd expect to be paid variable interest rates of the spot rates at year one and then the forward rates implied by the yield curve for the following years. Um, however, just for planning purposes and making the math easier, it would be nice to find um, a constant annual rate that has the same value. So mathematically, this means that the present value of interest rate payments dictated by the yield curve must be related to the desired fixed rate. So we're going to swap the implied variable interest rates in the future each year with a single interest rate that's valid for the entire term of the loan. So to do that, we have this equation that's on the lower left here. This, these are the implied forward rates from the yield curve. This is the discounting that has to be done using the yield curve. This is our loan amount. So this sum is the present value of variable loan payments where the varying is, is um, dictated by the implied forward rates. And the goal then is to say, well, I'd like to have just one single rate and just pay that rate every period. And the present value would be exactly the same. So that way the, the lender would be indifferent to which method you chose. Well, this equation right here is a simple linear equation, and the only unknown here is, is uh, R right there. So you can solve for R just through division, and you get this equation on the right. And that's exactly the same formula we got for the implied swap rate. Oh, I'm sorry, that is the, the implied swap rate uh, for, for the interest rate swap. So all these variable rates that are fixed by the yield curve, we swap them for constant rates. So here's an example. So you have a loan of $3,500,000 and the yield curve happens to be implied by this yield curve. So again, this is RS1, this is RS2, this is RS3, RS4, RS5. Um, but these are all spot rates. And I want to find the swap rate, which would be a level constant interest rate that would yield the same present value as the yield curve itself. So, well, the forward rates, we know from earlier that the forward rates are given by this formula here. We did that in our last lecture to get implied forward rates from a, from a yield curve. And if you do that for this particular problem, you get that the first year forward rate is 2.3%. The second year forward rate implied by the yield curve is 3.91% and so on all the way down until you go to the end of year five and that would be 11.2 interest rate. So you can notice here, for example, that this yield curve is giving larger and larger forward rates in the future and that's consistent with up here where you see that the yield curve is normal. It's increasing with time. So if you put that all into the formula uh, to calculate the swap rate, um, you get this expression right here, and you get that the swap rate is 6.40783.782%. So this is the actual swap rate. And it's interesting then to compute what would be your interest payments then. Because if I want to figure out what my interest payments would be on my loan, if I'm going to allow variable rates, I would have to use all these forward rates right here. On the other hand, if I use the implied swap rate, I have the same interest payment every year, so it's reliable. So in, in the... Um, uh, in the $3,500,000 loan, the year one interest payment would be $80,500, uh, but it would be $224,273.84, and you'll notice these are all the same because the swap payments are now fixed interest. But if I had variable interest payments from the implied forward curve, then you would see that they would vary quite a bit. 392, 552, 41, 313, 948, 69 for year four. So the interest rates vary quite a bit. 
So this is an example of an interest rate swap structure where I'm swapping variable interest. And again, these are only interest payments. There's nothing in here that says that the principal is being paid down. So these interest rates are computed on the same principal of $3,500,000.